I think maybe just the day before the election, I it is appropriate to talk about distribution and, um, and um, inequality, but I'd like to approach it in my own way and, and, and treat it as an issue in macroeconomics rather than an issue in distributive justice or, or in micro. <coughs> because <coughs> we've, got to, we've got to talk about that m macro aspect of it very seriously. Uh, mainstream economics has been indifferent uh, for many years to questions of distribution and, and, and po policy has followed, them in, in followed it in that respect. Much of the effort of uh, mainstream economics has uh, been directed to proving rigorously that perfectly competitive markets um, uh, are Pareto efficient. Um, it denies that state intervention in distribution can improve on market outcomes. And um, I think uh, uh, a phrase by Paul Samuelson sums this up very, very well uh, because it uh, um, uh, sums up a number of things well. Under perfectly perfect, under perfectly perfect competition, um, the resulting equilibrium has the efficiency property that you can't make any one man better off without hurting some other man. Man, it was written in 1970. This is the foundation of welfare economics. Then came Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, which um, uh, documented in exhaustive detail the increase in inequality since 1980. Since that year, the bottom quintile of American earners have received no increase in real wages, whereas the top 1% have received three or four times an uh, increase. Coming on top of the crash, Piketty's book, um, Rekindle Interest in Distribution Issues, both as a matter of um, distributive justice uh, and also um, uh, the uh, leading people to wonder whether the patchy and incomplete and unbalanced recovery of economics in recent years uh, has, was not somehow the result of growing inequality. I'll return to Piketty later, but here are two familiar indexes of inequality. First, the highly inefficient Gini coefficient for the United Kingdom, which is the best one can do in a short time, which just shows the spurt um, in this country in the 1980s and then the maintenance of that level of inequality. It's come down a tiny bit in the last two or three years. And then second from the United States, um, showing the growing gap between medium and mean income. On, on the right hand side you can see it. And those are both two indications of the growth of inequality. What I want to consider today, as I said, is the macroeconomic consequences of this. To what extent does growing inequality make macroeconomic stability more difficult to attain? Is there a pattern of distribution which will make economies more stable and which will less prone to boom and bust and also maybe uh, achieve a faster rate of growth? If so, what is it? But I want to start with, you know, more, perhaps on a more familiar note, with the micro Macroeconomics of distribution. Um, early on in their, in their courses, students are introduced uh, to the idea of Pareto efficiency. Uh, if every market in the economy is perfectly competitive, the, result, you know, the, the resulting equilibrium will be such that no one can be made better off without someone else being made worse off. But students are also taught that there are, there's an infinite range of Pareto-efficient um, allocations. So, um, you, you know, you, 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 the issue of distribution is still there. And that, on the whole, um, we're taught or we teach is a matter of political uh, value judgment. Furthermore, a redistributive policies can improve uh, welfare if one or more of the competitive, uh, one or more of the conditions of a competitive market are violated, such as monopoly, um, uh, public goods, externalities, asymmetric information, and so on. So these are distortions, and they can justify uh, a government intervention into the, into the um, allocation process. Um, now, but in the absence of such distortions, and without changing the initial distribution of endowments, can redistributive policies increase total welfare? That is a question. Um, suppose, suppose all 
people have the same wants and tastes. They differ only in the size of their budgets. Uh, and, and add to that the law of diminishing marginal utility, and it seems there may be a fairly rigorous scientific case um, for policies of redistribution in order to increase total welfare. And the Cambridge economist Arthur Pigou, um, the father of welfare economics, tried to do just this kind of thing in his book Wealth and Welfare, which was published in 1912. And he made two assumptions. First, everyone has the same tastes. And secondly, a rich man, A, gets less utility from an extra unit of wealth than a poor man, B. If true, if true, and if you, if you can measure, I mean, A, if the first assumption is true about everyone having the same utility curve, and the second assumption that you can measure the intensity of utility between different, different people and different classes holds, then you might get an, an actual uh, formula um, for increasing total utility. Pigo, Pigo also assumed, and this is a more, in a way a more interesting assumption, that with greater equality would come the greater efficiency of the workforce and therefore a faster rate of growth. And that was taken up uh, you know, it became part of the social democratic credo for many, many years. We now sort of anaesthetize it rather by call, talking about increasing human capital. But I mean, that was also a basic idea. So you could get a total increase in utility without making anyone else worse off, because the rich would gain from a faster rate of growth, though at a, at a, at a slower rate, a lower rate than the poor. Anyway, the point is that um, although this scientific argument emerged at exactly the same time as the welfare state was being set up at the beginning of the last century, it was subject to extremely damaging attacks. So that that approach to um, the, 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 the issue of, uh, of, of utility, the hope of getting a total utility function out of comparisons of, sub of people's subjective utilities through a kind of psychic psychic measuring rod of some kind, all that collapsed. And um, with that, welfare economics uh, uh, receded from the high hopes that um, uh, Pigou's uh, original work had inspired. What was left of scientific welfare economics had to do with market imperfections and how you deal with them. Distribution became a political or value judgment. And from the 1980s onwards, the judgment turned increasingly against greater equality. This was shown uh, very clearly in the tax system, which became increasingly regressive or decreasingly progressive. The idea of a positive link between efficiency and growth gave way to the notion of a trade-off between the two. And you know, the latest, uh, the latest um, kind of discussions um, sort of seem to imply that um, uh, you know, the, higher, the higher the rate of taxes, or, or rather the greater the welfare uh, paid for by higher taxes, um, the less the poor will save and, and the greater disincentive um, for the rich to work. And so it's regarded as a thoroughly bad idea. And the goal of social uh, policy shifted from that of trying to achieve greater equality to that of um, remedying absolute poverty, dealing with poverty defined in an absolute sense, and then the, that fuzzy Blairite brown idea of inclusion um, sort of um, you know, dominated um, that, that area of discussion. Um, and uh, in the Thatcher and Blair area, uh, eras, um, uh, one could, in Mandelson's words, feel pretty relaxed about being filthy rich. Uh, so that, that's sort of a bit of microeconomic and, and, and ethical background. Now I now turn to distribution and the macroeconomy. In, in the Keynesian era of the 1950s and 1960s, um, full employment policies and greater and greater income equality formed the twin pillars of the social democratic consensus. But the dots to link them up um, were never very, very clear. And these are the missing dots which make distribution a macro problem. And those missing dots are to be found in class differences 
in the propensity to consume. And this, these differences have macroeconomic consequences. In Keynesian theory, investment depends on consumption, not on saving. The more of their incomes people save, the less they will have to buy consumption goods. So as societies get richer, there's a simultaneous tendency for the saving share to grow and the, and the, invest, and the inducement to investment to decline. I mean, that, that's the way that Keynes sets it out. Hence the growing difficulty, for, he thought, of, of achieving full employment. Um, now, uh, you may, th that's, that's how the Keynes set, set, set out the problem. Um, under consumption theories, which, 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 is, which are the, the subject of the next passage in my talk, um, have the same kind of pivot, which is something to do with something going wrong in the saving ratio. Um, but they reach, they reach that route by a very, very different conclusion, and they might well be called overinvestment or oversaving theories. They have a long lineage starting with, um, you know, Sismondi, Malthus, Rodbertus, uh, Karl Marx, Rosa Luxemburg, all have under-consumptionist elements in their thought, though very, very few of them um, were, 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 were straightforward under-consumptionist theories. They had other strings to their bow. But what under-consumptionists were impressed by is the fact that consumption is less than production by an amount equal to saving. They assumed that all saving is invested, turning out more consumption goods. They then concluded that unless there's a right ratio between saving and consumption, the productive system would turn out more production goods than the remaining income um, uh, devoted to consumption to buy at prices that could recover the investment. So what you'd get is a lot of unsold consumption goods being turned out because of the excessive investment due to the oversaving. A lot of unsold consumption goods, so you'd get a glut um, and, and, and uh, periodic glut, gluts of unsold consumption goods, bankruptcy, unemployment, in short, the business cycle. So it was, it was really an oversaving theory of the business cycle. Could call it an overinvestment theory. Um, <coughs> the fallacy in that view of things seems obvious. Um, at full employment, or increased investment creates jobs in the investment goods industry, industries to replace jobs lost in the consumption goods industries. Workers are now paid to produce machines rather than shoes. Um, assuming the new jobs are paid the same rate as the old jobs, th there need be no net loss of income. <coughs> Total purchasing power is the same. Now, the more sophisticated under-consumptionists um, understood that. They had a problem, though, in explaining what they meant by oversaving. What, what is oversaving? And they hit on the idea that oversaving existed when saving exceeded any reasonable expectation of future demand for consumption goods. And that led them to the maldistribution of income. <coughs> Excess saving occurred when saving was divorced from the desire for more consumption in the future, but piled up mechanically in the class that had the least propensity to consume, that is, the rich. It was that part of saving which was the automatic consequence of people having unearned wealth and income. <coughs> and the more concentrated wealth became, the more oversaving there would be. And the most influential of these thinkers, the, and he was a true under-consumptionist, and his name is associated with under-consumption, was John Atkinson Hobson who is an English liberal economist um, at the turn of the last century. And um, he, he can claim the distinction of having influenced both Keynes and Lenin. Um, and his argument is summarized in his book, The Physiolo Physiology of Industry, which came out in 1889. <coughs> this is what, this is the key, the key, the key thing he says.
Yep. I mean, that is, that is the essence of the argument. Now, it, interestingly, interestingly in, in a subsequent book, Imperialism, <coughs> uh, very, very influential in international relations and in the theory of empire, Hobson applied his underconsumptionist theory to explaining imperialism. Imperialism provided a vent for surplus saving or capital, and thus a method for overcoming periodic crises of overproduction. And in a similar vein, Rosa Luxemburg, in, in the Marxist tradition, thought that capitalism required external markets, such as government spending on armaments, to justify, uh, to, to overcome the chronic deficiency of private domestic demand. Now, Hobson explains this, what he calls the undue exercise, undue exercise of the saving habit by the class distribution of wealth and income. The question was, how is it that wealth and income pile up in the hands of a wealthy class? <clears throat> well, his first step was to reject the marginal productivity theory of rewards to the factors of production. <clears throat> that seems an essential step, really, if you, if you, if you want to be uh, a, a real, a real under-consumptionist. Rather, what he did was he generalized Ricardo's theory of rent to cover the surplus of return over cost which capitalists were able to extract from the workers. This surplus was derived from their ability to monopolize what he called the requisites of production to get monopoly rents from the ownership of scarce factors of production like land, skills, raw markets, and techniques. This put capitalists in a superior bargaining position to labor. In every market, I'm quoting, the right of the economically stronger prevails, a fact which, of course, completely ignored by mainstream theory, which is a marginal productivity theory of rewards. The inequalities of wealth thus created by this power, uh, this uh, monopolistic control over some of the requisites of production, was then perpetuated by inheritance. <coughs> In other words, rent extraction by landlords and capitalists was at the heart of underconsumption theory. It meant that the fruits of productivity growth went unduly to the saving, not the consuming class, and the result was periodic gluts of production, which were the result of oversaving and overinvestment. And the remedy was fairly simple. It was to tax surplus wealth and redistribute it to those with a high propensity to consume. Doesn't nothing to do with Pareto efficiency and quite distinct from Pigou's argument. This was a macro argument. That would end crises of overproduction and the need to s export surplus capital abroad. Now, you may say, how does this differ from Marx? Well, the, the, the difference really lies in the fact that for Marx, um, profit, was, um, it, profit was rent, whereas for Hobson, only part of profit was rent. And therefore, he thought that it would be, and, and he also thought that it would be possible through social democratic politics to remove that bit of the rent and allow the profit system to go on in a healthier way, whereas Marx thought this was purely utopian. So um, I, I don't want to dwell on that. One, one can, one can, um, one, one can um, uh, say much more about the differences between um, Hobson under consumptionism and Marx. I just want to, before turning on, uh, uh, moving on, to um, cite Keynes's criticism of Hobson. I mean, Keynes felt quite sympathetic to Hobson, by the way, uh, but he had a technical criticism. In the first bit, he's describing Hobson's theory. Yeah, it's not not over say it's not over investment that's the problem, but under investment. In other words, 
Hobson's problem, Keynes thought, was that he lacked an independent theory of the rate of interest. He assumed, Hobson, that is, that the rate of interest always moved to ensure the equality of saving and investment, where in Keynes's theory, it was the changes in income which brought about this equality, the rate of interest being determined by liquidity <coughs> preference. In other words, I suppose, you generalize that criticism, Hobson simply ignored the influence of uncertainty on the, in, on, on the, on, on the demand schedule for investment. And, and, and that, that is at the heart of the differences. I mean, Keynes wasn't quite fair to Hobson in, in, in making that criticism because Hobson didn't claim that all saving is productively invested. It may be used for speculation in commodities and financial markets. Uh, and this is a form of liquidity preference. Um, it is less risky to buy an asset than to sort of start a business. So Keynes attached primary importance to increasing the rate of investment, Hobson to uh, 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 increasing uh, the, the ratio of consumption to saving. But of course, the two arguments weren't entirely you know, opposite, and, and the two views of what went wrong with the capitalist system uh, existed quite harmoniously, um, um, and, and also in politics. I mean, Keynes, for example, thought that keeping interest rates permanently low would lead to the euthanasia of the rentier. It's a famous phrase from chapter 23 of the general theory, and therefore of one source of rent, rentier rent, the cumulative oppressive power of the capitalist to exploit the scarcity value of capital. Hobson's remedy of redistribution through the tax system, Keynes thought could occur at a later date when you had an abundance of capital goods. And so then you would actually uh, move to the second stage, which he thought actually would come quite soon, when you would really start um, increasing consumption at the expense of investments. Now, to illustrate the compatibility between uh, Keynesian and underconsumptionist theories, let's look at one explanation of the Great Depression um, of 1929-32 um, 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 made by the American underconsumptionist Mariner Eccles, who was a prominent figure in the Roosevelt administration and was for uh, a, a quite a long time chairman of the Fed, Federal Reserve Board. And this is what he wrote um, about why there was a Great Depression. <coughs> Can you see it? <coughs> now, does that sound familiar? I mean, um, <coughs> Because, after all, um, this is uh, uh, something that one's hearing increasingly um, as a sort of, uh, you know, in explanation of what starts to go wrong in the 2000s and um, leads, leads to, the, to the actual, our own Great Recession. So let me, um, uh, in the next uh, bit of my talk, um, um, uh, get on to um, the modern underconsumptionist story and its current relevance. And I, I use as my chief witness a very interesting and perhaps not sufficiently well-known American economist called Thomas Pally. And um, whereas um, cheap credit plays an important part, as you can see, in Mariner Eccles's account of the Great Depression, it's become the main culprit in the underconsumptionist explanation of our own recession. Um, <coughs> Pally, Thomas Pally, and I'm going to quote a bit from him, um, 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 really restates the underconsumptionist concern uh, with finding 
a correct balance between consumption and saving, which boils down to the, a correct balance between wages and profits. Here's Pally. An increase in the profit share increases aggregate saving. The logic is it shifts income from wages to profits. That effectively transfers income from workers to capitalist, capitalist managers, and the latter have a higher propensity to save. Um, and, uh, um, and that causes aggregate saving uh, then, um, uh, uh, and then through a depression. It, 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 um, it, 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 and that leads to depression. And so this is written in 1999. Um, and a key argument in this tradition is that a balance between capital and labor did exist in the Keynesian era of the 1960s and the 1970s. In fact, it was what made Keynesian policy possible. Strong trade unions were able to push up wages in line with productivity, eventually perhaps above productivity. Extensive government transfers kept up mass purchasing power. Commitment to full employment created a favorable climate for business investment, and the state's own investment policies um, maintained a steadiness of investment over the cycle. As a result, business cycles were dampened, economies enjoyed unprecedented rates of economic growth. However, this benign capitalist in environment started to unravel in the 1970s for reasons, you know, which we probably are familiar with and we needn't um, uh, go on, uh, go, 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 go into. But the important point was the collapse of the profit share uh, as a result of of cost push, uh, perhaps uh, cost push by the unions, and therefore the necessity to recreate the reserve army of the unemployed. That is the basic plot. Um, and the cost of that was permanently higher unemployment, um, a, a, a shift of income from wages to profits, uh, but at the cost of secular stagnation um, punctuated by asset bubbles. According to Pally, 2001, the collapse of the dot-com bubble in 2001 reflected a deep-seated contradiction in the existing process of aggregate demand generation. He saw um, this uh, contradiction as resulting from a deterioration in income distribution. The resulting depressive forces were held at bay, he wrote, I'm quoting, for almost two decades by a range of different demand compensation mechanisms, steadily rising consumer debt, a stock market boom, and a rising profit rate. However, these mechanisms, he went on to say in 2001, uh, were now exhausted. Fiscal policy would only help temporarily unless measures were taken, I quote, to rectify the structural imbalances at the root of the current impasse. Absent this, the problem of deficient demand will reassert itself, and the next time round, public sector finances may not be in such a favorable position to deal with it. That was uh, seven years before the crash, but it was in the immediate aftermath of the dot-com, um, collapse of the dot-com bubble. In, in February 2008, just before the American economy collapsed, Pally wrote that the US economy relies upon asset price inflation and rising indebtedness to fuel growth. Therein lies a profound contradiction. On the one hand, policy must fuel asset bubbles to keep the economy growing. On the other hand, such bubbles inevitably create financial crises when they eventually explode. The need, he said, was to restore the link between wages and productivity. Now, this new um, underconsumptionism attaches enormous importance to financialization. The process, the, 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 the process by which the financial sector becomes more and more dominant 
in, in, the, in, the, in the normal activity of, 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 of a developed economy like, like the UK and, and well, especially like the UK. And what financialization does um, is to redistribute income, I'm quoting again, from productive activities to non-productive finance. The rich alone are the winners in that transfer because it involves no productive activity that might conceivably trickle down to the rest of us. In other words, this is a, a, a restatement of the Rantier argument, first advanced by Hobson. Um, now, back to Piketty. Um, though Piketty was not mainly concerned with stabilization, he provides strong empirical support for the proposition that inequality has been growing for the last 40 years. Using large data sets, he presented a U-shaped curve running from the late 19th century through to today with a middle period which saw a compression of inequality, that is between 1914 and 1970. And that, those series presented a major challenge to Simon Kuznets, who on the basis of time series ending in the 1960s, because that's when he, that's when he was doing those series, he predicted a growing equality. So it all depends when you start your time series and when you end them. The pitfalls of econometrics are legion, and very few uh, researchers manage to overcome them. Um, so, um, I mean, I won't dwell on this, but you see the U curve. Um, this is from the United States, and um, uh, and in the and the and in the UK, um, uh, in the yeah, no, this is this is for um, a, a number of. Is it United States? Yes, it's United States, and the next one is United States as well. I mean, the, the series starts uh, 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 is longer, and so you know the the, the U is is, um, is 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 less less pronounced. Now, this picture is consistent um, with the idea that is that there was a compression in the middle years of the century, um, with, um, a so with the idea of a social democratic phase in the history of modern capitalism. Piketty predicts that inequality will grow in the 21st century as the rewards to capital outpace economic growth. He has a formula R is greater than G. Um, unless governments impose high marginal tax rates <coughs> and a global wealth tax. Well, it's a sign of the importance of Piketty's intervention that it, that it provoked a furious debate, and it has. He's a, sort of, uh, he's a sort of pop star economist in a way. I saw him just the other day in Paris. He gave a very, 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 very good presentation, totally plausible, and, um, and he's, he's, a good, he's a good economist, and I think he's saying something very, very important. But, you know, there's a, there's a bit of celeb culture about it as well. But the important point is that he hit a raw nerve. And, 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 and the assault on him has centered on two things, his use of data and his theoretical framework. And in the UK, the uh, assault on his data was led by Chris Giles of the Financial Times, um, uh, who wrote an article um, on the 23rd of May 2014, asserting that the data used by Piketty do not show any increase in the share of wealth going to the top 10 and top 1% uh, uh, in the UK, rather the reverse. And so you have Piketty at the top and Giles really in the red. Piketty is blue and Giles is red. And what, what Piketty, this upturn in inequality, which is detected by Piketty, isn't detected by Giles's data at all. They rather show a decline in inequality over, over, the, uh, over the period since 1980. <coughs> well, this attempt to discredit Piketty, I think, broke down. Um, the interesting question is why it was made. Um, 
writing, one, one sort of person went through both sets of data, Giles's data and, and Piketty's data, and he wrote, um, to believe that Gile, the Giles series represents an accurate picture of the evolution of wealth inequality in the UK over the last 50 years, one would have to believe that the wealth share of the top 10% really did fall by 12 percentage points during the 1970s and by 11 percentage points between 2005 and 2006. Does anyone really believe this? Of course not. Instead, changes in the, t the way wealth inequality is measured have caused our estimate of wealth inequality to jump downwards at various specific points in time, 1974, 1976, and 2006. In other words, the data, the series were discontinuous, but when they were spliced together, it was always found that they um, pointed in the same direction, which is uh, growing, not growing inequality, but the reverse. <coughs> now, why, why is that? I think one's got to ask that question. I mean, there, there's certainly politics behind that. I mean, no, no obvious politics, um, and, 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 and it remains a, a question. Um, uh, so, um, the second assault, I'm, I'm, I'm rather hurrying through a bit because I want to finish and leave time for some questions, comments, and so on. The second assault was on Piketty's theoretical framework. And that's more serious. And Piketty's data is okay, I think. I think most people have more or less agreed on that. The historical record he so painstakingly dissects can be summarized by what Piketty falls, calls the fundamental force for divergence. When the return on capital continually exceeds the growth of the economy, wealth continues to grow faster than output and income, meaning that inequality continues to increase since there is nothing to stop the children of today's super salary earners um, becoming the rentiers of tomorrow. And the return to low growth, including low demographic growth, means that inequality will rise even more. And Piketty predicts that growth won't exceed 1 to 1.5% 1 in the long run, whereas the average return to capital will be more in the region of 4 to 5%. Critics, especially from the left, didn't like this. Because what they, what they accused him of doing was using a marginal productivity framework um, to explain the returns to capital, which left his explanation of growing inequality dependent on technology. So the reason that the returns to capital are growing, because capitalists are the source of innovation, and therefore they are earning progressively higher marginal returns on their activity. And Pally um, didn't like Piketty um, for this reason. And he wrote, mainstream economists will assert the conventional story about the profit rate being technologically determined. However, as Piketty occasionally hints, and this is, it's not in his model, occasionally hints, in reality, the profit rate is politically and socially determined by factors influencing the distribution of economic and political power. Growth is also influenced by policy and institutional choices. Then he says, that is the place to push the argument, which is what critics of mainstream economics have been doing unsuccessfully for decades. The deep contribution of Piketty's book is it creates a fresh opportunity in this direction. Now, the interesting point is Piketty draws no systematic conclusions from his data about the effect of inequality on growth or on the stability of the macroeconomy. All he says is that the continuation of these trends to greater inequality will erode the legitimacy of the political system. Now, let me briefly turn to my conclusion. What I've been arguing is that distribution is a macroeconomic question. Uh, as well as a micro question, because a distribution of purchasing power heavily skewed towards the owners of capital assets creates a problem of underconsumption relative to saving. This makes the macro economy less stable. The financialization of the economy increases this instability. It also makes the political system less legitimate. The mainstream view 
as I have suggested, is that the returns to capital have risen because technological change has made capital more productive. Um, an example of that is said to be financial innovation. But a more skeptical view would see much financial activity as rent-seeking, which tr simply transfers money from the productive to the non-productive sector. In, a, in Adair Turner's phrase, social waste. The problem to which the older generation of underconsumptionists drew attention was the failure of real wages to keep pace with productivity. A striking feature of the last five or six or seven years of the, of the, of the Great Recession has been the decline in labor productivity as workers have moved to less productive jobs. This has been a job-rich, um, productivity-poor recovery. So you can see what's happened to the labor productivity, I mean the divergence between the projection as it was made in 2010 and the outcome as we've experienced it in the last five years. And the fall in labor productivity must lead to even greater income inequality and therefore on the underconsumptionist argument to even greater macroeconomic instability in the future as the economy comes to rely more and more on debt. Um, and our economy, I think, is dangerously unbalanced. It has a very large structural current account deficit. Uh, quantitative easing has deliberately skewed asset holdings towards financial assets and real estate. I and mean, that's been the engine that's sort of driven such recoveries we have had. Belief that interest rates will remain low has created credit and asset bubbles. The combination of fiscal austerity and monetary loosening tends to stimulate inequality and reignite private credit cycles. In Keynesian terms, a situation in which the inducement to invest is falling, but income inequality is rising, is the worst possible basis for both stability and growth. But that may be the situation we're actually in. Thank you.